Hey there, Unreal devs. Welcome to this week's News and Community Spotlight. First up, QC Games, makers of Breach, a third-person action RPG with fast-paced combat, detailed how they developed a set of systems to create flexible, data-driven ways to create character abilities. In Breach, players can create their own character and choose from dozens of classes as they embark on a variety of missions across the globe in solo, co-op, or PvP mode. Learn more about their tools that allow their artists and designers to compose abilities in the interview below. Also, be sure to check out Breach as it launched into Steam Early Access today. Based on a Swedish pen and paper RPG of the same name, Mutant Year Zero brings its fantastical world to life in a tactical adventure game, combining the turn-based combat of XCOM with story, exploration, stealth, and strategy. Widely well-received amongst fans and critics alike, Mutant Year Zero doubles down on a strong narrative and endearing characters that you can't help but love. Its world, a post-apocalyptic landscape of overgrown cities and crumbling remnants of a civilization long past, is beautifully brought to life in UE4. In an interview with us, the bearded ladies share the intricacies of de developing with Unreal Engine, creating these unique characters, and crafting a tactical strategy game that manages to break the mold to draw in new fans. Leveraging the scriptability of the editor with Python, Thea Interactive began compiling their most common workflows, such as import processes or the generation of UVs, into repeatable scripts to help them save hours of work. With a fresh graphical interface, Optum was born. The tool allows you to analyze your Datasmith and CAD files before you import them into Unreal Engine. Thea will be offering Optum as a subscription service later this year, but they're currently accepting applications for alpha testers at thea.io slash optum. And the Global Game Jam kicks off next Friday the 25th. We're thrilled to be a part of the world's largest ev jam event and have gathered resources to help you prepare if you're participating, including our UE4 for Game Jams live stream with Tom Shannon. We're also raffling sweet swag bags, which include an Unreal Engine backpack, to those that submit a complete Global Game Jam entry in UE4. Sign up on the page link below to let us know if you'll be jamming. And now for this week's Karma Earners, many thanks to these incredible folks for helping out on Answer Hub. Sultan E, The Batch, Jackie, Turer, Coalfire Gaming, Christoph Morva, Ben Blodke, Thompson N13, Salih Balkan, and Nebula Games Inc. You all are absolutely majestic. So on to our spotlights for this week. First on the list is What Never Was, Akka Hallgren's short, story-driven, first-person game from the perspective of Sarah, a teenager tasked with cleaning out her recently deceased grandfather's attic, but she finds that not everything is what it seems. On to our second spotlight, Think Arcade, a student team from SMU Guildhall, recently launched Frostrunner, a first-person platformer speedrunning game for PC. The game has had over 50,000 downloads in less than 10 days with very positive reviews, and it's free on Steam. So be sure to check it out, and our many congrats to the team. And this beautiful Baroque room is this week's final spotlight. Developed over the course of the last eight to nine months, Rockley Kapunya pieced together all the elements, and you can see a more detailed breakdown on his art station page. So be sure to go take a look. Thank you for joining us for this week's News and Community Spotlight. Hi, and welcome to our Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Amanda Bott, and with me I have Ryan Gurley and Dave Ratty from our networking team. So thank you so much for joining us. And fellow community manager, Tim Slater. Hi, guys. Welcome. Glad to have so you here. Thanks. we're going to talk about some server optimizations, right? That's right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I figured I'd cover um, just kind of some high-level overview of how the replication system um, works. And based on that, uh, help you guys uh, get a better understanding of maybe how to optimize uh, your multiplayer games uh, on the server. Um, we know that that can be a, a challenge. Um, replication is, uh, you know, commonly a cost that we see in, in profiles and stat captures and, and so on. Um, so I thought it might be good to go through some of the techniques you can use without necessarily needing to go in and, you know, modify the engine um, to get some performance wins there. Um, 
is all very, very important. And so how does this, how, um, so a lot of people tuned in, it was last summer that we did the replication graph. And so how do these, I don't know, yeah. it feels like when it you wasn't said that, that I was like, ago. oh, I wasn't here for that. But then I remember sitting here and yeah. having that conversation. So. Um, how do these two pieces work together? Um, so a lot of the optimizations I'm going to cover um, work with the kind of legacy net driver, as we're kind of calling it now internally, and with the replication graph. Um, I'll try to remember to point out any cases where um, there might be differences between the two. Mm -hmm. um, but the things that I'll cover will be like optimizations you can do outside of using a, a replication graph. And then um, the replication graph is kind of an additional step that you can take uh, that will unlock more optimizations, but it may require more more work, more in-depth knowledge of you know, how your specific game uh, works uh, to squeeze the most out of it, I guess. OK, great. great. So we'll do our Q&A at the end, so feel free to toss questions in the chat as they come up. And then um, Ryan will address general questions. And we have Dave, to, our replication graph expert, <laughs> to comment there. So feel free to dive in. All right. Um, so just as a high level overview, as a refresher for anyone um, or for people who may be newer to the engine or multiplayer, uh, writing multiplayer games in the engine, um, at a very high level, uh, describe kind of how we replicate properties uh, to clients. Uh, and that'll help kind of provide a framework and allow you to maybe better understand why some of these optimizations are um, useful and how they work. Um, so you are probably familiar. You can go in and mark you know, uh, properties on your replicated actors as replicated. And then the engine will kind of automatically make sure those new values get sent to uh, clients who are connected. Um, and the way it accomplishes this is uh, every kind of frame that we run on the server for replication, it will look through all the replicated actors in the world, um, try to determine, it'll look for the replicated properties on those actors, um, do a comparison to see which of those have changed, and then for the ones that have changed, send them out over the network to clients. Um, this results in a lot of the, or this is the cause of a lot of the CPU cost on servers. It has to do that, that comparison and then the serialization. Um, so in a lot of cases, you can save on server CPU time by reducing the amount of these comparisons uh, that, that the server has to do. Um, and the main way to control this is through the net update frequency value, um, which is configurable on every actor class. Um, I'll see if I can bring up an example here. So we've just pulled up a uh, shooter game. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'll find the oh, is browser. Uh, this is different than how it's set up at my desk, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> we get that. Everyone has their own little setup for everything, so it's always fun to. <laughs> That's a, not an actor. But so what are you we'll looking for an actor? Player fun. And that's a per actor configuration, or is it for can you configure the whole can you configure for the entire project or is it per actor? It's per actor. Okay. Um so you can configure a default, you know, for any of your actor classes and then on each, you know, instance you can potentially override it. Um gotcha. if you'd like. I believe. So I'll just bring up the replication section here. Um, so a lot of you may already be uh, kind of familiar with some of these settings. Uh, the one I was referring to is this net update frequency right here, um, which defaults to 100. Uh, it's kind of maybe a high value. Um, but keep in mind, this will also be clamped to the frame rate of, that your server is running. right? So if you have your servers configured to run at you know, 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second, it's not going to do um, any additional replication updates beyond the normal uh, tick rate of the server. Um, but in a lot of cases, you don't necessarily need to update all of your replicated actors every server frame. Um, so certain actors that aren't changing as often, um, you could lower this value, and then you save all the, the time that would normally be taken on uh, considering those actors for replication uh, and comparing those properties, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so generally for Actors, like in most games, actors like most characters or pawns that are kind of moving around all the time, you'll want to keep the net update frequency higher just so that that motion is uh, as smooth as possible and your game looks responsive and is, is fun to play. 
Um, but for other actors that may not necessarily have a visual representation in the world, that's important to be up to date all the time. Um, like maybe some of your player state or game state classes, uh, you might be able to get away with uh, with a lower frequency. Um, so that's one thing to look at. Um, another thing is this net cold distance right above here. Um, some of you may be familiar with this or the concept of relevancy as we refer to it a lot. Um, this is the distance at which uh, objects will be cold for certain connections, um, right? So each, each client connection is usually based on where their uh, controlled pawn is in the world. And this cold distance will determine how far away an object has to be from that possessed pawn in order to be sent to that client. Um, so if, you, if we always had to replicate every object, every replicated object in the world to every client, uh, that can add up very quickly and uh, overwhelm the server. So we try to only replicate things that are nearby uh, and relevant to any given connection. And depending on your game and how it's designed and how long your you know, sight lines are and things like that, uh, you may be able to adjust this and tighten it up for, um, for various actors in your game. So the, the, you could have a thousand clients connected all at the exact same distance from an object. And as long as it's called at that distance, it's not gonna, you're not gonna have to worry about it on the thousand clients. But as soon as one person steps forward, it starts for that particular client. Uh, that's exactly right. Okay. Um, you may you may have to use a lot of these optimization techniques to get a thousand players on your server. Certainly, but, but yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, that's that's the idea. And it, the objects will replicated objects will only be sent to and processed for clients that are within their cold distance. Gotcha. So. Um, Force an update. Is, yes, that is an excellent point. Um, <laughs> And I should have covered that when I was talking about the net update frequency. Um, one, I don't know if there are any. You can probably just open. Files in you can probably just open game. Blueprint Editor there, right there and just do like a. That, yeah, that guy. I can just, just do like a begin. Yeah, just do like a begin play or something. Yeah. Or, or like. There's no. Not the ad. <laughs> yep. Straining to see this thing. So, oh, okay. Okay, so this is a function that you can call from C++ or Blueprint. And uh, what this does is regardless of what that, what the net update frequency property is set to for your actor, it will force that actor to do a replication update on the current frame. Um, so even if you have an actor with a very low net frequency, if something very important happens, you know, some property changes that is important to get out to clients so that they see some reaction or something happen in the world. Um, you know, a door opens, for example. Uh, kind of one-shot events like that are a good candidate for this, uh, where most of the time you can have a very low update frequency, um, you know, once every 10 seconds, every, even less once every second, uh, you know, depend on the object and the specifics of your game. Um, but even in those cases, if something happens in between updates, uh, you can call this and, and force it to happen. And this is probably one of the easiest ways to squeeze the most performance out of a game server. Um, we use this heavily in our internal games in Fortnite, um, and it's a huge, it's a huge, huge help for our, our server performance. So I highly recommend looking into this um, for your replicated objects that are, that are expensive. Um, another kind of trick you can do with net update frequency is uh, use the Adaptive update frequency. It is a CVAR. Um, I don't think I have Visual Studio pulled up at the moment, um, but there is a CVAR uh, net dot use adaptive net update frequency, and we had implemented this a while ago. I forget exactly what version it originally came out in, uh, and then we ended up disabling it again by default in 4.19 uh, because it was causing some issues. But if you enable this, it will basically, the engine will automatically try to determine the update frequency of your actors over time based on how often they are changing uh, when the engine does its own property comparison. So if you haven't updated the net update frequency on your actor, the engine will start ramping down the frequency to save time. Um, the issue this was causing is that without adding force net update calls to your code, uh, you are getting late 
you were seeing higher latency right, for actions after the frequency of an actor had been lowered. Um, so we disabled it by default in 419 to, to prevent these situations where uh, people were seeing higher latency in their games. Um, but the CVAR is still there. The feature still works. Um, we actually, it is enabled in Fortnite, uh, so we use it there. But like I said, we also make aggressive use of a Forcenet update to kind of mitigate those, those issues. So that's something else uh, to consider. Um, another thing to think about with, with frequencies is um, that since frequency is controlled on a per actor basis, you may have some individual properties on a given actor that may not need to update as often as others. Um, so this may force a certain actor to need a high frequency, even though it has maybe has a lot of replicated properties that don't need to be updated at the same frequency as other ones. Um, and since you can't control frequency per property, in some cases, it might be worth considering breaking out your actors into maybe multiple actors uh, where one of them has the high frequency updated, the information that needs to be updated at a high frequency, uh, and then the other actor can have the rest of the information and a low update frequency. Um, because there is a cost to, to checking all those, uh, all those other properties, even if they haven't changed. Yeah. That can be really good for properties that are like set on spawn and then don't change for the lifetime of the actor, but you still need to like authoritatively set them on the server and replicate them down once. So mm -hmm. sp splitting them up on different actors uh, could be a good way to work around that. Yep, good point. Um, and also just in general, um, before diving into to any of these too far, it's always worth just thinking about if you can reduce the overall number of replicated actors in your game or replicated properties in your game. Um, you know, maybe instead of replicating multiple integers, you can pack a bunch of data into a single bit field, uh, for example, um, or you know, maybe you can encode uh, strings as you know some other like enum values or something like that. Um, and it, it'll be highly dependent on your individual game and each individual use case. But always be aware of um, you know, every replicated variable you add uh, will add a cost. And those costs can add up, especially in, in large games and with large actors. Um, so always think about that as well. And then um, I guess I can show some of the net profiler tool, maybe, if see how the live demo goes. Hey, folks. Sorry about that. We had a few technical difficulties. Um, so sorry. To interrupt. <laughs> so we're talking about Lag. the profile, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So I was just about to. I brought up a Pi session of shooter game uh, with dedicated server enabled, and I was going to grab a network profile capture and then open it up in the profiler to kind of show you guys what that's all about and all the useful information you can get out of it. Um, so you can. There are a few ways you can start the the profiler. The easiest way is to just bring up a uh, console and type net profile, which will toggle it. Um, so I'll just run around a little bit, shoot a little bit, maybe try to find some ammo. And then I can do, you can do net profile disable to stop recording. And then I'll bring it up. So this is the tool. Um, the UI is uh, pretty old, and I apologize <laughs> for that. Uh, <laughs> there are some, you know, some things that could be improved here, but there's still a lot of information you can get out of it. Uh, and this is located uh, in the engine binaries.net folder, I believe. Um, <laughs> now I have to find where this build was. So one second while I do that. So it's in the, the build itself directory. <laughs> it uh, was this one, right? Is it? Yep. It's not in starter content? No, it's not in starter. Is it in templates? <laughs> trying to remember where it is. Shooter game. Would it be in the project file or the engine <laughs> folder itself? The project file. So I think that's actually on C. Ah, okay. I know. We're monsters. We keep <laughs> them in different places. Um. <laughs> I just browsed to a file in the... 
Hoping that, that player palm blueprint I yeah. think is, is a native bear. So this is like four. This should take me right to it. There you go. <laughs> it's tucked away. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, you would have never found that. Never. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so <laughs> so basically, I was just looking for this this project directory. But when you make it, when you do a network profile capture, uh, it'll also be saved to your project save directory under uh, profiling. I guess I can show this to the stream. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just the shoot again project directory under save uh, profiling. And then it should create one of these dot end profiles for network profile. Um, and then that's not the actual profiler, but I will copy this path. <laughs> oh, right into the profiler. And then I guess I can show. So I just clicked the open file uh, button up here and navigated to the profile I just took. So we can go ahead and open that up. That'll load and uh, show you this view um, where you can see a graph uh, with a bunch of data you can filter. These are the, the default kind of options. You can see bandwidth information, you know, broken down by properties and RPCs um, and so on. And actually, before I get into that, um, because we were running in Pi with a uh, single process checked, it actually recorded both the server's connection and the client's connection here. Um, depending on what you want to look at, you can look at either one. Um, they're both useful. Server captures are generally more so, uh, because that will cover all the property replication. Um, you can take a network profile on a client and see kind of what RPCs they're sending. Um, but if you're optimizing you know, server property replication, you want to look at the server's connection, uh, which will be, in this case, uh, it'll be this one, because this is the one with the, the ephemeral port on the address. Um, so have that checked. You can apply the filter. And now the only data that it will show in this graph is the data that was associated with that one connection. So this is showing all the data that the, the server connection sent to the client um, while we were capturing. Um, and did you actually show them how you open this profile? We had opened it ahead of time. Um, uh, yeah, I can show just like kind of the whole tucked away. process. Sure. So I'll just close that and do this process again. So as in D, right? D, yes. So it's a unique binary that's running on the, with the install, in the yeah, so in the build it's a, folder. It's a separate binary from from the editor or, or anything, but it is installed with the build under uh, engine binaries and in the .NET folder here, um, because it is a C sharp application, um, and the source code is also um, available, as well, okay. on GitHub, uh, and it's just called network. Profiler in here, there it is, mm -hmm. and that opens up the tool, and then you can open up your profiles uh, from here, and it remembers the path from last time. So, we can just but you don't need profiler again. running while you're capturing in Pi. No, you don't. The profile. No, so this tool, this separate tool, only uh, parses the files that were generated by okay. the engine. So while you're while you're actually capturing in Pi, or um, it works, you know, in standalone uh, builds as well. Uh, all the capturing code is built into the engine. Um, so you don't need anything extra there. Just run the console command, and you're good to go. Um, so I'll filter this connection again. And uh, if you had run it in a standalone, uh, like on a standalone server, for example, uh, you would see multiple, you would see each different client's connection uh, in this list here. And you could filter by those if you wanted to uh, as well. So. Uh, yeah, so we were just talking about this chart. Um, you can also, so this captures data every frame, and you can kind of zoom in on sections of it. Uh, or you can click on individual frames to see data about those frames. Um, there's a lot of information about kind of bandwidth usage here. Uh, but another useful thing is to look at this actors tab here, which will show you um, which actors were replicated on any given frame or on the, the range of frames uh, that you have selected. Um, the MS column is basically is a rough number of milliseconds that it took to replicate these actors, um, kilobytes per second, how much bandwidth the actor used, uh, and so on. 
Uh, the update hertz is not, I believe it's not actually averaged uh, correctly across frames. So these numbers are a little higher than you might expect. Um, do we have a player pawn? I guess my player pawn didn't well, the replicate first one on this pawn. range. Yeah, I'm just saying it. The player pawn didn't didn't oh, uh, right, yeah, yeah. replicate anything here, which is a little unusual, actually. Um, but one thing that I did want to talk about is this this waste column here, which uh, ties into what I was saying about net update frequency earlier. Um, waste is just called waste here, um, but what that means is the percentage of uh, kind of replication updates where the system compared properties, but found that nothing changed and therefore didn't actually replicate anything. So we spent CPU cycles comparing the replicated properties of these actors, uh, but none of them changed, right? So if you have high, if you have that case, you'll see a high waste on your on your actors in this uh, in this profile, and those actors can be a good candidate for lowering the net update frequency because it implies that their properties aren't actually changing that often. Um, and when they do change, or when something does important change, changes, uh, you can probably use the force net update uh, function, like I mentioned earlier, um, to make sure that clients do get those those updates in a timely manner. Um, yeah. So those are the basics of that view. I must have. This must be a, a range where uh, maybe my player wasn't wasn't moving. But if we pick one where it looks like there was more stuff going on, you'll see some some more stuff actually replicated here. Like this is where some data for my gun uh, replicated. Although apparently I was still standing still. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can see standing still and firing. <laughs> probably. Um, but you can see that you know something on the the that this web gun class replicated some properties and you can see which individual properties actually replicated here and how many um, how many bytes they used up in the uh, in the final packet that we sent out um, so this can also be useful to see which of your replicated properties are are taking the most bandwidth or uh, the most time right so the ones that have a high count here uh, will be the ones that are replicating more often um, and then there's a lot more you can play around with here. You can, you know, filter filter even more by by actors here. Um, shooter game is fairly simple. It doesn't have that many different actor types, so uh, it's not that hard to just look at the list. But in a more complicated game, um, you may want to to look for specific uh, specific actors here. And then there are some other views that can give you, you know, kind of an overall view. Like you can see, you know, how many times specific actors. Uh, replicated to see which ones are replicating most frequently in your game, uh, and it may be worth, you know, focusing your optimization efforts on those. Um, same with individual properties uh, and RPCs as well. So something like gunfire, or a lot of gunfire in one scene, is probably going to add a lot to the replication because you're each bullet is being replicated. Yes. Um, and so the more people you add to that, the higher bandwidth cost and. Um, so that may, I mean, it makes sense, but it's good to be able to actually like visualize it and see, hey, you know what, maybe these guns are firing too quickly or they're replicating too many objects mm -hmm. in one scene. So. Exactly. So we've had a few people kind of asking about the hertz versus frame rate. And would you be willing to kind of expand? Because they're um, like 677 SPS, and that's not, that's not what it represents. Right. So the, the update hertz here in this, mm -hmm. in this chart, yeah, like I said, it's not, I'd have to actually like go back and look at the code <laughs> and see how we're at. <laughs> how we're actually generating that number. Um, I think it's pretty pretty clearly there's a bug here where it's not showing the actual um, update rate. Although I guess if the editor is running with an uncapped frame rate, that might be the case. Um, sure. But yes, but I believe the difference between update hertz and like rep hertz here is update hertz is again like how often we do that property comparison to see what we have to send, mm -hmm. and then the rep hertz is how often we actually did get something to send uh, based on that comparison. Okay. So and then hertz and frame rate we just kind of use interchangeably. Um, so I apologize for that, but <laughs> hertz is essentially you know a frequency you know frames frames per second. Mm -hmm. Okay.
What's that? Um, so, good with that. Um, <laughs> actually, can I yeah. get on with that? Um, so, those are a lot of the tools um, that you have. Um, the, there are a couple other things that are maybe get into a little more advanced um, topics. You have to do a little more setup work, uh, maybe in your game, to get these to, to work uh, well. But uh, network dormancy is another big area of uh, potential optimization. Um, we use the dormancy system uh, extremely heavily in Fortnite, for example, uh, and like we couldn't, Fortnite servers could not perform as they are now without the system and without our heavy use of it. Um, so uh, I recommend looking into it. Uh, it's probably more suited for certain types of games, uh, like in Fortnite, for example, where a Fortnite map has a lot of kind of static actors, like building pieces and trees and rocks and all those kinds of things. Um, that don't necessarily change very often, right? They kind of just sit there for most of the game until someone goes up and damages them. Uh, they can be dormant for that entire time where they're not changing. And then while an actor is dormant, it completely skips all of the replication updates that we had been talking about. So it's kind of similar to having a low frequency uh, in a way, but it will just never update at all uh, until it is woken up from dormancy or flushed. Um, yeah, I, I would describe it as a, it's a contract between the game code and the replication system. The, the game code says, this thing is dormant, it's not going to change. You can stop checking it, I'll tell you. I'll tell you when it's going to change again. Um, whereas you're, you're lower, having a very low uh, update frequency mm -hmm. and uh, is just the replication system saying, I'm not gonna check this very often um, unless you tell me. So, so with dormancy, the idea is the game code says, stop checking me. I promise I will not change it uh, until until I tell you. And if, if you do change it without telling the replication system, the replication system, when it does like go to replicate that actor, it might not realize that people aren't have all those changes that you kind of made behind its back. So that's that's kind of like the, the key difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and you can control uh, dormancy from blueprints now. Um, so I can show you some of how that works. I guess I can cover initial dormancy. First, I believe it's in this details. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you can set net dormancy for your actor classes here. Uh, awake is kind of the default state um, that we've been using so far, right? It's it's awake. It's it's checking the normal net update frequency all the time. Uh, same replication that that you know and love. Um, and then dormant. Uh, all is kind of the, if you have, you know, during the course of gameplay, you have something you want to make dormant because you're not going to be, you know you're not going to be updating it for a while. Um, you can set it to dormant all. I guess setting this as the default doesn't. It could make sense for some actors. Um, but the main difference I wanted to illustrate here is the difference between awake and initial. Um, so if you have an actor that's placed in the map and it, won't be changing for a while, uh, most likely. You can set it to initial dormancy. And that means that, uh, just like Dave said, it will not even be considered for replication at all um, until game code tells it to kind of wake up. Um, so if you have a lot of replicated actors placed in a, in a large map, uh, if most of them can be initially dormant, then you can have huge wins uh, in terms of server performance. And this is exactly what Fortnite does, like I mentioned, for all those actors that are in the map that you know may not be changing for a while, like buildings and trees and, and stuff like that. Yeah, the key is it, it's only for in-map actors, and it's basically saying, telling the replication system, like everybody already has this, you don't even have to keep track of who already has it, for, versus, a, versus an actor that, that like is awake and then goes dormant, like the replication system still has to make sure everybody gets that last, that last update before it can completely like forget about it. Um, dormancy initial is just like, pretend I don't even exist because everybody has me and it has me up to date. And so it's, it's kind of like to the replication system, it doesn't even exist until it goes out of that and transitions out of that initial dormancy state into either dormant all or, or dormant awake. Right. So it's definitely, it's definitely like the initially dormant actors are like by far the cheapest, like for replication, because they're basically just, they're basically just get ignored. Um, Yep, exactly. And that, that works because, like, like Dave said, the, the, replicated, the state of those replicated properties or the values of those properties will be the same on the client and the server when they, when they initially like, load the map and spawn these actors. Um, 
So there's nothing, yeah, there's nothing to do in that case until something changes. Um, when something does change and you want to make sure all the clients get that update for a dormant actor, uh, you can, you just set net dormancy. Yeah, so you can set net dormancy. Um, so let's say you change some replicated properties uh, on your initially dormant actor, for example. Uh, you can call set net dormancy wake. Again, you can call this from C++ or a blueprint. Uh, and this will cause it to wake up in the replication system. It'll start updating there uh, normally. It will detect the properties that have changed and update all the clients. Uh, and it'll remain awake until you set it um, to be dormant again. Uh, in addition to that, sometimes it's also useful to simply flush net dormancy, um, where you can do this if you're only changing, uh, you know you're only going to do a brief change for like a single frame, you changed one property, and you want to send that update out and then have the actor go dormant again because you probably won't be changing it again for a while. Um, so it's kind of like a force net update, but for dormancy. Um, so depending on the situation and you know the gameplay of any particular actor, um, you can use these calls to uh, to manipulate that state. And and I think force net update will implicitly call flush net dormancy. That's so correct. if so yes. if you, but but it, and it also in addition to that it will also change the like, it, it does what force net update does with changing telling the replication system replicate this right now. So it's 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 modifying sort of the frequency a aspect of the whole thing. But um. Yeah, flush net dormancy doesn't change your dormancy status, but it does say, "Hey, I've like I've changed. You gotta you gotta at least get this one thing. This well, this one change has to be through. So so something can be dormant all. You can call flush net dormancy, change something, and that that one update will go out to everybody, and then it will kind of just go back to being dormant. It'll it'll stay mm -hmm. dormant. It's not going to continuously check. It's just going to make sure everybody gets that one update. So that's we you know usually you want to go to you want to go from dormant all to awake if you're going to be, if you're going to have like a period of time where it's going to change, like say, like in Fortnite when a building takes damage and it's going to like regenerate health over a period of time, we will take, we will put it awake, allow it to, to regen up and then once it's full health, well, it'll, it'll go back to being dormant versus like if it's just a one-off change, if it's, if it's like a, maybe a, a edit or something like that that happens on the building, we might just call uh, one flush net dormancy and not, not go to awake and then back to, back to dormant. All good yeah. points. Um, <laughs> dormancy sounds so simple when we explain it this way. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> just going to bed and waking up. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, but that helps a lot with optimization and making yeah. your your you know your pings lower for everybody. And yeah, you're 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 calling it at at just a higher level. You yeah. know, you're you you don't you're not checking to see, well, when's the last time this replicated? You're not, and then you're not checking, well, did anything change? You're just, at the, at the very high level, you're just saying, okay, this guy, he's not changing. The game code has told me that. I just gotta make sure everybody has the up-to-date state, and then I, then, I can, then I can go on, I can move on. So it's, it, it's a pretty good, gotcha. pretty good optimization. Yeah, and like I said, almost, like the vast majority of replicated actors in Fortnite um, are dormant most of the time, and it's a, huge reason why um, we can get Fortnite servers to perform as they do uh, is by using this system. So. The more you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess there's another uh, sort of advanced uh, topic that I can mention briefly. Um, I may engage Dave for this too. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, so actually, if I could get Visual Studio yeah, up, need, that's I think probably... You need code. To explain this, hmm? so there's. It should be here. So there, there's a, there's a, a source file net serialization dot h, is where all the fast array serializer is, and, and there's a pretty like, lengthy comment at the top of it that explains how to use it. So I would if, you know, if you're looking where to where to go for this stuff, just I would I would open that header file and and, and just read it and uh, net serialization dot h. And that'll 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 sort of give you the more spe specifics, but I think me and Ryan will kind of try to go through the the high level overview of what what that thing does. I can um I can just maybe start talking about it while you, yeah, while you keep looking. Go for um, it. <laughs> so it's kind of the idea is 
the fast array serializer pattern is used is used when you have a array a t array of structs and you want to replicate that um, but you don't want basically it's useful in cases where you have arrays of structs and the data inside that struct is kind of big and maybe doesn't change that often and you don't want the replication system to check all you know you don't want the replication system to go through each element of the array for each element in the structure and say did this thing change or not the fast array serializer allows the game code to kind of have more control and to tell the replication system when items are added and removed or changed from that array so it's it's kind of like the dormancy idea where it's like the replication system is doing less pulling but it's relying on the game code to tell it when to add and remove things and when things have changed um, and sort of the way it works internally is you know when you when you tell when you, when you call mark item dirty or mark array dirty what you're you're sort of actually incrementing a basically just an integer sometimes we'll call it like a change list or you know a key or a replication key but you're basically just incrementing an integer behind the scenes and the replication system when it goes to compare what it what the server has to what each client has it looks at what the, what that client's number was it doesn't look at what the data was that it sent the client last it just says what is like what's the change list that this client is on um, and if it if there's a mismatch then it kind of goes in so it, it does it at the high level at the array itself like the array itself has has one of these change lists and it will quickly just not look at anything in the array if that high level number isn't different uh, and if that if it is different then it'll start going through every element in the array and just checking the, the sort of change list number on each of those elements and then for the elements that are either new or have changed since the last version we sent uh, the client that whole the whole uh, data all, all the data in that element of the array will will be sent over um, the other nice thing about it is on the receiving side you get you get some nice callbacks that tell you when when elements ever changed when they were added or when they're about to be removed so it's it lends itself to game code that wants to like kind of manage that stuff so it's, it's good for things like uh like inventory systems uh the game playability system makes like pretty heavy use of it um you know in general if you have if you have that kind of data that's uh, i mean ideally like ryan says you want to replicate as little data as possible but you know inevitably you, you, games have inventory systems and and these types of things and so this is you know it's a convenient way of like you get a lot of performance and it's convenient i think to, to program for because you get those callbacks um are you are you still loading this up or uh it looks like it's loading the solution okay um and it's taking time <laughs> taking time yeah so what you basically what you end up doing is like you you subclass you, you you have to have a container class which has the array of your items in it so you so you take your i've been talking about an array of structs it's really a struct that wraps an array of structs and so you subclass that container uh from one of from the base fast array serializer container struct and then you sub subclass your um you subclass the the item you know the items in your array they need to be a subclass of the fast serializer item thing i can't remember what it's what that struct is called right now but um you, you do that you, you do some stuff with struct traits to tell this the uh the unreal reflection system that this type has a a custom uh net delta serialized function and uh then in your custom net delta serialized function you call this templated uh fast array serializer uh function with your types um as the templated arguments and it will it will do what i just described um um Let's see some other I, some other things about that is so the order is not actually guaranteed in that in this stuff and i believe that the comments should call that out um for the most part they it will be but with packet loss and dro drop packets or reordered stuff like it's possible for it's not a strictly ordered thing uh but uh it, it, in, in a lot of ways it, it's almost like conceptually a map on like kind of underneath the hood where they each have these we have these keys and and these and these values that's what we care about syncing up we don't this the code doesn't care quite as much about the local order um, it's also possible for the client to sort of 
either predictively, if you want to think of it that way, or just doing whatever it wants, it could add stuff to that array locally. And it, uh, as long as you don't uh, have conflicts in the replication key for those items, uh, you can, uh, that'll sort of be transparent. Like you'll still get the replicated version that'll come in on top of it and, and the sort of locally predicted or added elements in that array can, will, can still exist. Um, the, the ability system uses that for doing like predictive gameplay effects uh, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, this is this is a this is the this is the file I was talking about. Um, yep. So net serialization .h, I finally found it <laughs> in Visual Studio. Um, but yeah, so there's comment like Dave said that goes through kind of the basics of how it works. Um, I just did a search. I was maybe going to pull up. I don't think Shooter Game has any specific. It probably code that doesn't. Uses but it, but maybe we could look at one of the ability yeah, system. Yeah. Uh, uh, classes if or if you know one you can do like uh, probably gameplay effects dot h effect dot h one more yeah. um, oh you tossed in an extra t <laughs> there you there go. We go it's a little hard to see um Yeah, a zoom in a little bit like that. <laughs> Is that too much? Nah. Um, so it should actually, be. Do you want to? I guess. Drive I, yeah, I'll try to drive. I'll see if I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's the file that or the uh, element that you're looking for? Uh, the the file is gameplayeffect.h, and we're, I'm going to look for you know, like I think active gameplay effect. Looking for that guy. Nice. Yeah, so, so this is what I'm saying. Like, this is kind of like the container class. You can see it implements uh, or it, it, it inherits from FFAST array serializer. Um, and then, man, this is, this computer is chugging. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll see. This I thing. think it might still be doing the find. Yeah, I, I think I. If you want. A secret find. Yeah, there it is. Oh shoot! I think I did that twice. I, it's parsing the solution too. Let me see. Does yeah. it have Vax installed? <laughs> I can. Um, here, let's disable Vax. But it might be Visual Studio. Okay, maybe this is a little better. I don't know. Um, Oh, this may not have been the easiest one to, to pick because there's a lot of <laughs> crap in here. But um, <laughs> here's yeah, so here's like the struct trait thing I was telling you about. You got you have to do this to say, hey, I have a custom net delta serialize function, which uh, you know, structs can like structs can have custom net serialize functions, which is just like this is this is the way that we take this structure uh, and and pack it, for, you know, write it out to the to the networking streams. A net delta serialize function is is kind of the same idea, except that you get you can delta you, you you kind of get that call per client and you get you have a space to use to uh, to kind of do bookkeeping to figure out what you last sent that client so you can sort of determine what that network payload should be based on what the client was last sent or what he's last acknowledged um, it's, it's kind it, of, bas it basically allows yeah. you to implement the comparison uh, kind of that I was talking about earlier that the engine does by default for for normal replicated properties. Um, the engine has kind of that built-in delta comparison, which is this thing I've been talking about this whole time that takes up CPU cycles. Um, that that override lets you basically implement that comparison uh, yourself, which is how the the fast array serializer works. Okay. So yeah, like kind of like I said, so so. This thing does a uh, Vax was not doing good. Let's see if I can find it in the in the CP. Oh, because I you disabled I disabled Vax. Okay, <laughs> right. Oh gosh. Um, normal stuff works. Here. Um, kind of like right click the GPU. It's F12. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So this is probably not a good example to pick because it's this stuff actually does even more complicated stuff. But uh, let's see. <laughs> so let me 
This is the call I was telling you about. So, so this, this really, I mean, this is all you really have to do in your in your net delta serialize is you just call fast array delta serialize with 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 these templated arguments, and then your gameplay, you know, gameplay effects internal delta params and and, and this come from that, that gets passed in um, your game, gameplay effects internal. This is what I was actually talking about. This is this is the actual. Um, um, Expo. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, there it is. So, say, like I say, so here is here is the actual T array underneath the hood uh, that that we're going to replicate, and it's replicating F active gameplay effects, and F active gameplay effects is inherits from F faster faster array serialize um, serializer item, um, which has that sort of I was talking about the change list or the the replication key. ID is, is built into that base class, and, and that base class has, you know, has has the mark item dirty. I'm going to just go back to the to the header file because I don't think I'm able to find a good case here. Um, Okay, basically, so so this is the this mark item dirty is the is a call on the uh, the actual ar array itself, but I, I, there should be um, I believe that 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 uh, f function should also exist on the items itself. Like you can just ha if you just have the item, you should be able to just call mark item dirty on it, and it should it should forward it up. I think. Um, but the main point being is that you know these are these are the functions that you want to call when you're when you're mutating the array, and uh, then the callbacks that you get on the client side when uh, when when that stuff happens are what I was talking about earlier. These are yeah pre-replication remove, post-replicate add, post-replicate change. Uh, those can be pretty those can be pretty handy. Um, so this is like ability system doing stuff, but like yeah, this, this thing's about to be removed. Let's um, see if we have to like invoke any uh, any events or, or whatever bookkeeping that that system does. Um, same thing with adding. You know, when it, when when a new one comes in, it, it does all these checks. It does like some timing stuff to figure out like if the thing just happened or it, it, it's trying to just figure out if if the if the item was just added like actually on the server or if it's just like you're just finding out about it due to like relevancy or like in progress type of stuff. Um, so yeah, so you, you can write systems that take advantage of that. And uh, you know, the big advantage with fast race serializer is it's, it's similar to like the net dormancy and, and, and this other stuff we've been talking about is you're just you're, you're hinting or you're telling the you're telling the replication system, don't compare all these bag of bits every time. I'll I'll tell you what bag of bits you need to send when they change. Um, and uh, you, you can, you know, you can get a lot of performance out of that depending depending on the system. So it's like if you have an inventory system that has like a ton of items and it, you know pretty good size structures, like this this will be a pretty good pretty good win for you. Um, if, if it's a really small list, if there's like three items in it and and they're just a couple, you know, there are a couple bytes each, like it's you know it's probably not worth it. Um, but you still get the callbacks, which can be nice too. Um, yeah, I think that's I think yeah, that's kind I of it. That's, that covers that covers, covers fast, that pretty fast much. Array. I, again. Uh, <laughs> encourage you to, to read the comment in uh, net serialization.h which kind of summarizes all of this and uh, and you can always refer to to later if you want to try to implement this in your own game it is I would say it is it is like C++ only this is this is definitely something that doesn't really like expose well to blueprints so if you if you are in in that realm you know you, you probably you know, it, it, maybe the ability system is a good example of a system that uses this stuff but like what it, ex it doesn't expose those containers to blueprints, but blueprints have there's an API for like adding and removing gameplay effects that ultimately modify those arrays. So it's just just kind of layered is how I would recommend uh, looking at that if if you're if that's relevant to you. Uh, so yeah, so, cool. There's a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> it's a network of information. Yeah, I could not have a pun. Sorry, <laughs> I waited, but I couldn't. Um. Is there um, anything? Yeah, I think 
else you wanted to cover, or we have loads yeah, of, we have a ton of questions. questions. Yeah, I, think, I mean, yeah. we went over all the, the broad topics that uh, that I wanted to go over today. So yeah, if we have time for, for questions, we can roll into that. All right. So uh, one question I have, um, they're asking if there's any particular reason why replication of variables or dispatching of RPC is a sing is single threaded. So is that is that true? And then um, uh, yes, why? that is true. Um, did you want to take this? One? I, I mean, I <laughs> we both try it's, to answer it. I guess I'd say it's it's a it's kind of a legacy thing. Like it's just the engine long ago was single threaded, and it's just that's just kind of how it, how it's been. I think. Um, the, there's a lot of, um, so I guess the main reason for that is a lot of the, the replication update, uh, the way it works right now is it kind of inherently has to read or write uh, actor properties that are updated you know, on the game thread. Um, so we can't, like, unless every, the engine doesn't have kind of the thread safety mechanisms under the hood to kind of ensure that those gameplay actors, um, that actors updated on the game thread are all, that all that stuff is thread safe. Um, yeah, like, like one example is like, there's like uh, pre-replication is, uh, that's what it's called, right? There, there, there are virtual functions on actors that are getting called like before like an actor goes to replicate. And so if you had sort of like many, if you were like going wide with all this stuff and you were, you were having you know, multiple threads that were potentially trying to replicate the same set of actors to different connections like you potentially get into cases where like yeah, someone calls pre-replicate sets something up you know while he's in the middle of that somebody else kind of comes through and does it to the same actor and they might stomp each other out or that you know there's all right. these kind of hazards right there that aren't you know th there are like solutions to those problems but it's like that's that's part of the friction um you know i think the other thing is multi-threading multi-threading servers doesn't always isn't always beneficial. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a really really complex topic, but it, it is something that like we've you know Fortnite does pretty well with single threaded servers by because it packs them so tightly, um, and so going wide with like our individual servers isn't always there's trade offs there, and it might not always be yeah. the best situation. That doesn't mean there aren't situations where it, it would be a, a, a good thing to have, um, but that just I'm trying to give you I guess, more context like what, what you know. Yeah, why why is it like that? Yeah, generally dedicated servers um, are uh, have kind of historically been uh, single threaded, like like they've mentioned. Uh, it may be more beneficial on say, like for a listen server uh, type situation. But again, we still have all those all the other friction of of those game thread kind of updates yeah. that are that can be problematic. Uh, we are looking into ways to uh, kind of multi thread some of the lower level kind of like system level tasks that happen in networking, like, you know, the socket calls and any kind of lower level, like packet processing that happens, like compression or encryption, um, things like that. But all that happens kind of at a lower level below uh, where all of this is exposed to, to game code. So. All right. Um, they're wondering, um, why do, why does server performance degrade the longer the service server has been up? Um, I would say that probably depends on how different games behave. So mm -hmm. there are several things that could lead to that. Um, so if you have a like, kind of a long running, you know, game session that's spawning actors throughout gameplay and those actors are, you know, staying around, like maybe you're spawning like pickups or item drops or, you know, projectiles or things like that, that just kind of increase over time. And if they're not being cleaned up correctly and they're still being considered for replication, then those just kind of build up over time over the course of the match and each each additional actor uh, is going to add to that cost over time. Oh. Yeah, you'd be surprised how, like, how many like little things can end up leaking. Like we've had, you know, that, that example is kind of like, yeah, actors might leak and you might, you know, it might the, this, the, the size of the world might grow, but like, um, you know, internal like like timers on like, like uh, the world's uh, game uh, timer manager uh, we've had cases where like timers leak, where somebody will set a timer that repeats and then never, and then the guy who was listening to it kind of just goes away and, and no one's actually listening to it anymore. But it, just like, just the, the fact that the list can grow so high and then some of those like operations onto that list end up, you know, being, end up being linear. 
and like it, those types of problems are it can be surprising how how much those can those can filter in but uh, you know i i don't think there's anything intrinsically about like if i just let a server run idly uh for a long time like it, it should not degrade like if, if performance is degrading on a server like it's it's kind of one of these reasons that we're, we're talking about and there's probably like an infinite number of <laughs> ways that that could happen um but that's those are kind of the, of things that we've seen like common yeah common things that you've yeah. seen um, they're wondering if the server tick is set to, or is 30 frames per second, um, is it useless to set net update time to be greater than 30? Yes. All right. But it shouldn't it, hurt anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, it, could, it, could it affect prioritization? I'm not sure. I, I'd have to look at that code and see how it works, but it, you, you, I don't think so. It probably clamps it, or it probably is like, <laughs> like if you replicate, if two actors are replicating every single frame, but one has a higher update frequency than the other one, when it goes to calculate, like how long has it been, how long like overdue for replication is it? If that calculation is different, might be different between the two ones. I don't think it is. No, a in the in the legacy net driver, it just the frequency yeah. just sets. It drives yeah. the like next, next update the, yeah, time that's right, that's for right. an actor. So, it, uh, the way that frequency is actually checked in the engine is. Uh, It'll just compare the current time against the next update time for that actor. And then when yeah. that actor replicates, we set the next update time based on the frequency. So it won't affect prioritization. Like it's a binary okay. thing every frame, whether an actor is updated or not. Oh, all right. Uh, what's the cost of using rep notify variables over um, the usual, just like replicated? Um, there's a tiny bit of extra bookkeeping at the engine level um, where we have to kind of queue up those functions, the notify functions to be called when we detect that a change has occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and then just there's the cost of the, the function call to invoke those. And then, you know, whatever the actual implementation of that function does. Um, but I don't think it's anything to be particularly yeah. concerned about. I would say like, like server side, it's, it's like negligible. Like there might be a little extra bookkeeping that just happens in like rep layout or something for that stuff. But I don't think like when the server's like deltaing properties and everything, like it doesn't care if the client is gonna call a rep notify when it receives it or not. Yeah, the, actually that's a good point. The The server doesn't even track anything for it, Yeah. right? It's all it's all tracked client side. So it should have no effect on, on server performance, but the client will do that tiny bit of extra bookkeeping. Um, all right. Uh, what are some red marks or numbers uh, they should look at in the net profile or net profiler, maybe? And what would you consider good and bad for multiplayer games? Um, that's really hard to answer generically um, because it's going to depend on your specific game, what your target frame rates are, how many actors you have, how many replicated actors you have, um, and you know which of those actors are most kind of important like you know you most uh games probably have like a character or something that um that will need a lot of that'll spend that will spend most of our replication like time and resources on mm -hmm. you know to make sure characters are up to date and stuff and then other kind of objects in the world usually take less time um but yeah it's it's really about can you hit your frame rate targets um for your game yeah, I, I'd say when I, do, when I do this kind of work, I don't usually start with even a budget in mind. I usually just look at the big picture and kind of just try to break it down and see where things are proportionally and then look at what like the target like frame rates are and then kind of like work backwards from that. Uh, that said, I, there's pr I, I probably do have an intuition about like what numbers are really bad, but I don't, it's like, I wouldn't know it until I saw it. <laughs> like right, if you pull up the network profiler and saw like, I guess all that, you know, all 100% all in all the waste columns, like that that's kind of like the red flag. But, you know, if you saw like, you know, you, you see an actor taking, I don't know, whatever, 20, 25% of like your, your bandwidth budget. Like the, 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 certain numbers would probably sound alarms, but it, it's hard to like, it's, it's hard to kind of just give like absolute numbers. Right. Um, I, th I think games are different. Like some games really, they go out of their way to be low bandwidth. I think other games kind of don't, don't mind as much. Um, and some people care a lot about server perf, other people, if it's if it's can keep up with the frame rate, then it's fine, you know, kind of thing. So it's it's hard to. It's a case by case say. basis. Yeah, kind of case yeah. by case. Um, do we have any plan to have the network profiler added to the UI of the editor, and so instead of having to record, save, and load separately? Uh, we are thinking about ways to do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Me? Uh, I can't. Um, <laughs> we don't really have any specific plans or dates right. or anything, but um, it is definitely a, a pain point internally as well. And yeah, we'd we'd like to to improve that situation. That's not a no. Okay. It's not a no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, does ForceNet update override dormancy? It flushes dormancy. Okay. So, like I say, it, it will. It won't put you into the awake state, but it will force an update to go through, and then the actor will main stay in its dormancy in that dormancy state. So, um, well, let, let me clarify: if it's dormancy initial and you call flush net update or for or flush net dormancy, that will transition you out of net out of dormancy initial into dormancy all. Um, because you're no longer, you know, the idea of dormancy initial is that you haven't changed since your initial state. You've now changed once since your initial state, but. Um, but only but, through that update. But only, yeah, only, well, you're never going to go back to dormancy initial, but it's, it's going to only make one yeah. update go through and then it's going to keep you at whatever dormancy like level you were. Um, are there any resources we have on remote debugging uh, dedicated servers? Or are you aware of any good ones that sometimes we utilize? Um, <laughs> not, <laughs> not it's really. not good. I mean, what, what we kind of, you know, we'll, we'll do a, we'll, we kind of do it a lot at the system level. We're like, we'll use, um, a, like we have like a cheat command that will, like literally in Fortnite, you can type cheat, whatever you want, and then that will like execute that command on the server, kind of like, like Archon or, or kind of other, you know, other things that are like that. But um, so, so basically that just allows you to run console commands from a client on the server. That alone can be useful. Like a lot of times what I'll be doing is I'll, I'll, be, I'll be using that running console commands. I'll have the server log up as, I, as, I'm, as I'm working and I'll kind of I'll use that to like poke around and like, you know, do obj list or um, uh, whatever kind of uh, engine kind of debugging stuff is already in there. Um, additionally, like individual systems, like, you know, RepGraph has some of this stuff. Uh, even the ability system has some of this stuff too, where uh, there, there'll be like, I'll set up like an RPC or something that I, that I can say, hey, so, you know, to this, from client to server, I, I'd like to know this information and then the server, then there'll, there'll be a server to client uh, kind of RPC to, to go back and, and tell the client what you need to do. And sometimes you, you can then write more code to, to draw that up on the screen or something like that. But it, it, But it's very much like a, Per case basis, where it's like you got to kind of you kind of got to think about that stuff. Be like, is this is this a is am I do I need to de debug, uh, you know, server logic from a client? And if you right. do, you kind of need to like I think you kind of need to plan ahead for that. Um, it would be nice if those those could be made more generic, but it's just I don't know. That's, yeah, one of the things like you mentioned, like running console commands on the server, um, yeah. you can do that yeah. with like the net take the, yeah. take the network profile capture that I showed earlier. Um, if you are running. You know, on standalone, you have you know a cooked build or whatever, uh, and you have your client locally, and you want your dedicated server, wherever it is, to record one of those network profilers. Um, you can do that if you can just send the, the console commands over to the server. Yeah. Um, what do we have internal rules for unreliable and reliable calls, and can we talk about that at all? Um, minimum. Don't use reliable calls unless you absolutely need to. <laughs> yeah, pretty. That's much. a pretty good. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. I would never. I would. I would say. I would, I would never use a reliable multicast uh, event. I, I. I think that's kind of been debated if, if that should even be kind of allowed. Um, client server and client and server RPCs. I think there are more cases where those should be. Those can be reliable. Um, but you know, it. It's, it just really depends. It's. If it's easy, to, I, I would I would try to frame it like this. Just because you think it's important, like I don't, the player would have a bad experience if he didn't get this. Like that's that's probably actually not a reason to, to make it reliable. But if it's like my code will not function if this doesn't get there, like I'm I'm building in assumptions that this this will be there, um, th then that's usually a good case. Maybe a good example is that maybe again the ability system like server try activate ability is is reliable, and then it will send a reliable like confirm or, or deny. Um, th those are kind of important because both sides are kind of doing bookkeeping about like, okay, I think I'm activating this ability, but it's not confirmed yet. And I don't, you know, it, you don't want to add it. You don't want to have that code in addition to having to absorb like a package. You don't want that code to have to be detecting a drop packet. Like you, you, you really want that, 
the, the ability system code to just like rely on like, yes, this absolutely has to get there. But it's like, just because it's like, if it's an RPC that's just gonna like play an explosion or, or an effect, just because you think you really should get there, I wouldn't, I would probably still make that un, uh, an unreliable thing. Um, I, th I think, you know, reliables can be, they can, they can be a little tricky because they, they write to the send buffer immediately. They, uh, there's a lot of extra bookkeeping about that. Like I, if, if you get in cases with like lots of packet loss and you have lots of reliables going through, you have, you have the potential to like really cause like a traffic jam and, and just kind of all this chaos can, can kind of happen. So I don't know. Yeah, so, I would say uh, absolutely don't, uh, and we pretty much ban this internally, uh, don't, <laughs> not sending um, like a reliable yeah. RPC every frame. Um, especially yeah. from a client that could potentially have like an uncapped frame rate, for example, yeah, uh, can very quickly example. exhaust uh, the reliable buffer and uh, cause, you know, backup in the network stream as they get resent uh, if there's any packet loss and so on. Um, so generally anything that has to be sent every frame uh, is usually you're kind of updating some like property like value that could be unreliable and you usually want just the latest version of that value anyway. And um, you know, if something in the middle gets dropped, it doesn't really matter, right? Things yeah. like kind of character positions and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's like probably lesson number one is is your your state should be replicated through properties. Use RPCs for events, um, like one-off things that are like you either get it or you don't kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, if you ever find if you if you're ever doing it the opposite way, if if you're ever like replicating a property all the time. Using properties to replicate events can be can be dicey, but replicating state through RP through events RPCs that's that's really bad. Um, I would that's the thing to stay away from. Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of um, I guess the rule of thumb that I try to follow and try to encourage other people to follow is uh, if you're writing an unreliable um, client RPC, so server to client RPC. Uh, strongly consider whether it should be a replicated property instead of an RPC, because um, most in most cases they can, and in most cases uh, it'll work out better if they are. All right. And so we do have a little bit of a follow-up question. So we're talking about server performance degrading over time, and then um, there was some clarification that it was due to time precision. Mm. Um, can we explain? I'm not. Um, so there are the lots one... of fragmented comments. So. <laughs> sure. Um, there, one thing that may that this may be referring to is the fact that the internal like timer on the NetDriver is uh, a 32-bit float that stores um, seconds. So if you have a really long-running server over you know over a day or something, I forget the exact number of hours where the the precision uh, breaks down. But uh, in that case, you can run into problems because uh, the the internal timer isn't high precision enough and uh, really. I think we just need to make that a double or something and um, yeah. <laughs> fix that that problem. Um, but you're welcome to do that too in, in your build of the <laughs> engine if you if you need that. Yeah. Um, and then, do you have any information or anything you can share on sort of what they can expect from your team in the future? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're both giving me this stuff. like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, more optimizations. I mean, we're constantly trying to improve, you know, the lower level systems, you know, aside from the things I covered today that are kind of exposed to the game level, you know, how we replicate things internally, you know, there are still, you know, there's still room to, to improve, uh, that code in the engine. Um, so we're looking to improve that. Um, wrap it up there. The main thing I, <laughs> I can talk about, I think. All right. Cool. Well, that sounds yeah. good. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions this this stream. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a it always feels like networking is kind of magic, right? Like it is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. voodoo, and so there's certainly a lot to uncover, and it's very valuable. So thank you both for <laughs> joining us today. Um, Real quickly, I'm going to drop the survey into the chat. So if you would like to see, this is one, letting us know how or what you thought of the stream today. And also, this is the best way for you to tell us what you'd like to see in the future. There is a question there. It's like, what topics would you like covered? So there had been a lot of requests you know, for more networking streams. And um, 
this is a result of that. So definitely be sure to fill that out. Also, we pick one person from that list to send a t-shirt to. So at random. Yep. And so you could also get some sweet swag. Yeah. Who doesn't want that? We'll reach out to you by email. So make sure you, if you are interested in doing that, make yes. sure you put a, a good contact email on that survey. You're under no obligation to include one. Yeah, but, of course not. Um, also, always check for local UE4 meetups. If you're making a project, um, it's always good to get feedback from folks in your area, or you can start one up. So check out meetup.com slash pro slash Unreal Engine, and we'd love to see more of you there. Um, you want to talk about the spotlight and the countdown? I, of course, do. So every week we start our stream. I, I had a blank for just a moment. Ago. <laughs> so every week we start our stream with a five-minute speed uh, development. So if you're working on a game, we'd love to see it. We love showing off all the work that people are doing. Uh, so take like 30 minutes, compress it into five minutes, send it over to us at community at unrealengine.com. Uh, include a PNG of your logo as well as a short description of that. Uh, and you may see your, your game featured on the countdown. Again, we need, it to, we need to make sure it is five minutes. Um, nothing more, uh, nothing less. Mm -hmm. So it can be anything from level design to doing blueprints to sequencer, whatever it is that you, you are doing work on. Uh, and if you've already submitted one and want to send us an updated one, we'd love to see those as well. Yeah. And now we're always looking for more community spotlights. Feel free to reach out to us or we're often scrubbing through the forums. Again, the release projects or work in progress. We like seeing what you're up to. So definitely share there and keep Follow an eye on, on, on social media. Social media. Social media. Yeah. We're on the same page here. All the things. Yeah. And again, thank you both for coming. This was definitely a wealth of information. I know the chat was already being like, oh, I've yeah. taking rapid notes <laughs> and trying to figure out. They're like, I have tons of ideas for how to improve my game. So you're definitely helping lots of folks out. So we appreciate you coming on. This is great. All right. All right we guys. will see you all next week and talk about the gameplay ability system. So, see you then. All right, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye.